Good afternoon, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Today, we're thrilled to have a nationally known researcher and thoracic medical oncologist, Dr. Charu Agarwal from Penn Medicine. We hope Dr. Agarwal will walk us through her approach in treating early non-small cell lung cancer so that we can reiterate the current standard of care practice in our community settings. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Charu Agarwal. Thank you so much. Um, great honor to be here, and I look forward to discussing this with you further. Perfect. Dr. Agarwal, we have divided the non-small cell lung cancer algorithm into three parts. Stage 1 to stage 3, where the treatment is in fact from curative intent. Then stage 4, with or without actionable mutations. Our focus today will be on stage 1 to stage 3, non-small cell lung cancer, as we will be covering metastatic disease in other videos. Here is the algorithm. If we could please start off with stage 1 disease. Yeah, so absolutely. So I, I really love the way that you've differentiated it because there is so much going on now in the early stage curable uh, setting that we really need to devote almost, um, you know, even in meetings, it's almost like a separate section now. For stage one lung cancer, these are often patients that don't even see me upon initial presentation. These are patients that are directly referred to our surgical colleagues following usually a biopsy with our interventional pulmonary colleagues or not even a biopsy. You know, these patients are often directly referred to our surgical oncology colleagues through their primary care or other referral patterns. Most of the time, if these patients are surgically receptible and medically operable, they undergo surgical resection. And then, of course, uh, our surgeons are uh, very, very um, good about referring these patients for radiation oncology, as well as multidisciplinary discussions for patients where we should consider uh, uh, SBRT. Uh, and that is often in the setting of medical inoperability, not so much surgical resectability, but you know, older patients, COPD, uh, patients that may not have enough pulmonary reserve. Um, I will say that recently there has been a focus on also making sure that we are doing optimal surgical resection, that we are performing adequate lymph node dissection, even if there is a patient with a peripheral one centimeter left upper lobe nodule, to make sure that we are actually having an oncologic surgery performed. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Just to reiterate, surgery and SBRT is often the mainstay here. But even for stage 1A disease, five-year survival is like 70%. It's not like 90% what we tend to see with early breast cancer or stage 1 colon cancer. And you'll talk about this, and chemotherapy here does not play a big role, but I think that even though this is early disease, stage 1 disease, these patients need to be monitored very closely. Absolutely. And that's what we do. And um, we have been following these patients every six to 12 months, um, you know, as per NCCN guidelines um, and make sure that they're in some kind of regular follow up. It doesn't always have to be with a medical oncologist. Sometimes these patients will just follow with the surgeon or perhaps with a pulmonologist or maybe with the radiation oncologist. But you're absolutely right. And I think in the future, we'll probably have other alternative therapies for them. We know that there isn't really a huge benefit from chemotherapy. However, could we consider other targeted agents? You know, there's a trial uh, ongoing looking at EGFR mutant population, as well as thinking about immunotherapy. And then I think earlier detection eventually will help us raise that overall survival. Absolutely. And then, of course, things like ctDNA will play a big role in monitoring these patients. Our next line ends up being stage 1B and stage 3A. We have seen a lot that has happened here, particularly. Dr. Agarwal, can you walk us through this part of the algorithm? Absolutely. So a couple of, uh, I should say, three big changes in this algorithm over the last uh, two to three years. So about two years ago now, in December of 2020, uh, was the approval for the first targeted agent in the adjuvant setting with the approval of osimertinib based on the ADORA trial, based on a DFS advantage for patients with stage 1 to 3 non-small cell lung cancer harboring an EGFR mutation. It's important to note 
that the current approval of osimertinib is actually stage agnostic. So the current approval actually reads in surgically, surgically resected patients with an EGFR mutation, you can administer osimertinib. Um, so I think that's one approval. The second approval that we should talk about is uh, the approval of atezolizumab. Uh, following the Empower 010 study release in ASCO 2021. In October, we received that approval. And again, this was based on a DFS improvement alone. However, this approval is quite specific. It's for stage 2 to 3A non small cell lung cancer, and it's contingent upon PDL1 expression. Uh, only PDL1 positive patients, so greater than or equal to 1%, as you outlined in the adjuvant setting. And it's also very specific that it needs to follow administration of adjuvant systemic therapy. So it's quite different when you look at the approval for osimertinib versus that for atezolizumab. And finally, this year we saw the approval for um, neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy with the approval of um, Checkmate 816. This was based on an improvement and event-free survival, uh, three cycles of nivolumab plus platinum-based chemotherapy following surgery led to increased uh, PAT-CRs, uh, which then translated into an EFS benefit. So the three approvals have really changed how we think about uh, stage 1b to 3 in non small cell lung cancer. I think the first thing we should really define here is the role of molecular testing. Um, you know, most of these trials, at least the neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy trials, excluded patients with EGFR and ALK. So at the minimum, we should at least get single gene testing for EGFR and ALK. Many would argue that why not get the full panel? Uh, but, you know, we already have issues getting full panels in patients with metastatic disease. So I always stress when I talk to my colleagues that at the bare minimum before we institute chemoimmunotherapy, someone at least lets us get single gene testing. So EGFR app should be done. And then of course, we once we do surgery, we need to have EGFR uh, and PDL1 testing. So how how am I integrating all of these approvals and all of this into my practice once I have a patient that comes in? Usually for my stage ones and twos, I'm not really, I'll be honest with you, not really thinking about neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy. I am thinking about it for my stage three A's and those two, N2s, uh, single station disease. And the reason for that is that I'm not intending to use neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy to downstage a tumor. I'm not trying to make somebody resectable. I'm really trying to get that PAT-CR. I'm trying to improve that EFS. So I'm taking patients that are already surgically resectable, EGFR app negative, going to my surgeon and saying, hey, I think this one would be a, this patient would be a good candidate. Uh, I'm not currently basing it only on pdl one positivity for neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy because I think the benefit is there regardless of pdl one expression. It is higher for higher pdl one expression as expected, but currently we're not limiting it to any particular pdl one and then following up with surgery. Um, for the patients that are stage 2 or 1Bs um, and, you know, are otherwise good candidates for surgery, we are dis discussing them at our multidisciplinary tumor board, but they're often going for upfront surgery. We are getting uh, our gene sequencing on everyone. Uh, some would argue that, you know, getting whole uh, panel sequencing maybe is a little bit much, but we find that it's actually helpful for me to know if somebody has a Keras G12C mutation, even if that's not immediately actionable, because I can sort of tailor if any subsequent therapy may be needed in this, uh, in the metastatic setting, it's good information for me to have. Um, so I would offer platinum-based chemotherapy if there's an indication, you know, node positivity, tumor size, etc., and then follow it up with three years of adjuvant osimertinib, um, as well as a tezolizumab where PDL1 expression is greater than one percent. I know there's a lot of controversy even here. We should you reserve it for greater than 50% or greater than 1%. Um, as you're aware, in the EU, the approval is only for PDL1 greater than 50%. I tend to use it or at least offer it to my 1 to 49%, but definitely recommend for my greater than 50%. Um, so I've said a lot. I'll stop here because this is a really meaty, I think, segment of this um, conversation.
No, you rightly said there have been three important approvals in this setting, and you stress the importance of NGS testing in early stage setting, especially after OCMERGNEP and atezolizumab approval based on PDL1 testing. Now, Dr. Agarwal, if you have a patient with ALK, ROS, RET, or MET in these settings, how does your management truly change this? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think we have data uh, for adjuvant electinib soon. Um, uh, so we'll have some answers. Um, I'll be honest with you. I mean, this is more of a practical, uh, you know, what would you do if I have a patient with an outpronce location? I would discuss adjuvant electinib with them. You know, I, I don't think that the benefit would be insignificant because uh, really, ALK is, is a disease of the CNS, and if I can give them an agent up front that can prevent CNS metastases, uh, if somebody has stage 3 in non-small cell lung cancer and has an ALK translocation, I think it's worthwhile that we discuss this. Um, I think some of the other um, biomarkers, such as maybe MET, BRAF, and KRAS, I tend to put in one category, where maybe the benefit isn't... <laughs> isn't that much in the adjuvant setting. And ROS and RED, I think, are in between. Uh, ROS and RED, I would discuss with the patient, but actually a situation hasn't come up yet. Um, but definitely for ALK, I would consider it. And these are the patients that were not included in the neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy. So I think, again, it's an important point that once you have that NGS and know that information, you should not consider uh, exposing them to immunotherapy. Exactly right. So we've actually found some patients that we were considering for neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy who turned out to have out, and we actually altered our approach and said we'll do chemo radiation instead, um, just so that we didn't want to expose them to immunotherapy. That's exactly right. Well, the only OS benefit we have here is from chemotherapy. We wait more mature data for OCMERTNIP and atezolizumab from overall survival data. If a patient in your clinic decides to forego the chemotherapy in adjuvant setting, would you then move on to IO or OCMERTINIT in this scenario? Yeah, so, you know, you raise a very good point that the only available data that we have is for uh, for overall survival is the platinum-based chemotherapy. So in my practice, if patients are otherwise candidates for adjuvant chemotherapy, I tend to administer it. I tell them that this is the only strong evidence that we have that we can actually improve your overall survival. The argument is not as strong when you think about smaller stage, lower stage disease. And, you know, I think as the follow-up increases, the argument is not that strong, right? Year seven, the incremental benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy is perhaps not that high. Having said that, we still do it because there is a survival benefit. I have not yet had the um, had an opportunity where I've skipped it and gone straight to EGFR therapy or or atezolizumab. I am very much still sticking to the sequential approach. Okay. Now, diving into the stage three unresectable disease, we have promising long term data from Pacific Trial. Dr. Agarwal, can you please walk us through your approach here? Absolutely. So I think uh, we've become more comfortable with saying patients are unresectable, right? I think before Pacific, we always used to struggle in tumor boards that, oh, can we make them, you know, can we do something? Can we, oh, borderline resectable, right? So I think both surgeons, radiation oncologists, and us are very comfortable now declaring uh, especially in light of the five-year Pacific overall survival data, that if somebody is unresectable up front, let's just say we'll go, go ahead with chemo radiation, follow it up with a year of immunotherapy, and still get upwards of 40% um, overall survival at five years. I think it was 43% with the overall survival of Pacific. Um, so that's been our approach for our stage 3Bs or our patients with multi-station N2 disease we don't often try and do chemo immunotherapy followed by surgery. We will make the decision up front, give them chemo radiation. And, you know, even in the consolidation setting, there has been a lot of excitement recently. Um, we published earlier this year a trial called COAST that looked at combinations of immunotherapy along with Durvalumab. We added Electomab as well as Monolizumab. 
And we found that the uh, disease free survival, or I should say progression free survival in this situation was much greater than what would have been seen with Dervalumab alone. And based on that, we've designed a phase three randomized trial looking at uh, combination immunotherapy. So I think there's a lot of excitement in this area. There's also a lot of excitement in moving immunotherapy up front. So uh, starting with chemoimmunotherapy and radiation, there have been phase two trials demonstrating safety. Um, Keynote 799 is one uh, example of that, where the outcomes seem pretty, um, pretty favorable. So I think this is going to continue to evolve. We are going to see combinations. We are going to see early integration. And then also, I think, following one year of immunotherapy, using ctDNA to really determine those patients that may be the highest likelihood for relapse. And Dr. Agarwal, as you've mentioned, timing, when and where is so important. Talking about specific trial again, once you've completed your concurrent chemo radiation, how fast do you initiate their Valumab? Because that is also a time-sensitive issue. Yeah, and I think it's time-sensitive based on just post-hoc analysis of Pacific. I don't think we've demonstrated this in a randomized fashion. However, having said that, that data does look really good that if you initiate within the first 14 days, maybe you'll have a greater benefit. But, you know, much of that goes to the biology of the disease and the and the patient characteristics themselves, those patients that are younger, healthier, lack of comorbidities are probably more often the ones that are able to start earlier. I find in my practice that um, I try very hard to see them back between weeks two and three following their concurrent chemo radiation so that I can get a CAT scan, see how they're doing, and I start no later than weeks. And just to stress the importance of maintenance immunotherapy uh, with Dervalumab is in fact approved in the setting of responsive as well as stable disease, because sometimes we have been hesitant about the stable disease aspect of it. Absolutely. And I think that CAT scan that we get, that early CAT scan is only to make sure there's no progression. I mean, we are barely able to determine response. Um, so I tell patients, they're like, why are we getting a CAT scan? Will you see something on it? And I often say, no, this is just for me to make sure that I'm not alarmed, I'm not seeing anything new, and this is just going to be a quick uh, read. Certainly very important. And then, of course, the question comes up, a patient with actionable mutation who has stage 3 disease and has undergone concurrent chemo radiation therapy outside a clinical trial. How do you proceed with maintenance treatment in these settings? Yeah, I don't do a uh, Duralumab for my patients with EGFR and ALP. Um, I've often run into a situation where they have a recurrence shortly following chemo radiation, and you know I've sort of been happy in retrospect that we didn't we made the decision to not use immunotherapy. We've gone to osimertinib with good results and elecnib, etc. So. I uh, usually will discuss, at full disclosure, I, I'll tell patients that I want your gene sequence saying, let's start with the chemo radiation. And then at the time of your visit to discuss the map, I have a full-fledged discussion about the implications of immunotherapy. Most often my patients will say, I don't want the immunotherapy. Absolutely. And Dr. Agarwal, a last segue before we close. A patient who has been on maintenance to Ralumab now has progressive disease, let's say oligometastatic disease, or has profound uh, progression. In that settings, do you treat that oligometastatic disease and continue with Dervalumab? Do you add chemotherapy? What's your often approach in that settings? It's a great question. So for somebody who's on Dervalumab and has an isolated area of progression, I will often come in with radiation therapy. Uh, after ensuring that there is no absolute other evidence of disease, get an MRI, get a PET, um, and continue to evaluate. But if there's poly progression, if there's more than one sites of disease or three sites of disease, um, I will often add a graft on systemic treatment, either platinum-based, full, full dose platinum-based chemotherapy, or sometimes I will go on to a quadruplet. Uh, chemoimmunotherapy, just thinking that what can, what else can I add above and beyond PD-1? Absolutely. Certainly all very, very important points. Just to recap here, we are waiting on mature OS data from Ostimertinib and IO in adjuvant settings, and Pacific trial-based regimen is in fact the standard of care, still remains a good option for otherwise unresectable patient population. 
Dr. Orgawal, thank you so much for taking the time to share your thoughts with us today and recapturing the standard of care practice. Thank you for having me.